Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 3120, Transition to Advanced Mathematics for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Now, before we begin lecture 23, I wanted to give a quick summary of where we are in our lecture series and then give us some highlights of where we're going to be going to. Uh, so just so you're aware that, like with our lecture series as usual, we have three categories we always talk about in the lecture. We have our mathematical topics we talk about, we have our logical topics that we talk about, and we also have our communication topics that we talk about. Uh, now, amongst our mathematical topics, we began our lecture series with the conversation of set theory. We transitioned to combinatorics, which was computing the cardinality of finite sets and then we've had a recent discussion about the set of integers being a very important set that we've been talking about. Um, with regard to our logic, we've started with things like Boolean algebra, uh, understanding the different operations and meanings of statements and the arithmetic involved with logic. Then we started learning proof patterns. So this includes things like uh, direct proof, contrapositive proof by contradiction. And then with regard to our integer unit, this was really a hybrid unit where the mathematical topics and the logical topics were actually in harmony. The whole focus of that third unit was uh, mathematical induction. Uh, so now, as we move on to a fourth unit in our mathematical category, we're gonna then talk about what we refer to in mathematics as a relation. Um, now, I wanna give you some connections of where this is gonna be leading to us. Uh, relations, which we'll define in this video, will ultimately lead to our fifth and final unit in this lecture series that of functions uh, will be able to mathematically define properly what a function is and then look at some applications of that. For example, how do we work with sets with infinite cardinality? Combinatorics was all about computing finite cardinalities of sets, but it turns out infinite cardinalities have some subtleties that will be necessary to consider as we transition to math mathematics. And relations is going to be the first step in that direction. We'll develop less of uh, the, in the couple, next couple lectures, we'll develop the notions of relation and then we'll transition to functions as our final unit, like I said. Now, like we saw in unit three, our topics on integers, the mathematical topics and the and the proof topics actually went hand in hand. And this actually kind of shows that the deeper and deeper one gets into in mathematics, you really can't separate the logic from the mathematics anymore. We're gonna see that over and over and over again. Um, as we introduce relations in lecture 23 and lecture, lecture 24 and beyond, as we talk about relations, it's going to be constantly we're proving stuff about relations over and over and over again. And we're going to be using the proof patterns that we've now developed. The logic that we develop in this lecture series is now able to come to bear and help us understand these more complicated mathematical topics like relations and functions. Uh, and so while we will continue for a while to have some lectures uh, helping to improve our ability to write proofs, uh, communication wise, logically wise, be aware that for the rest of the series, our goal is to prove things about the mathematical topics we're introducing. And all of the logic we developed is to get us to this moment where we can start to analyze our mathematical objects through the lens of logic. So with that said, what is a relation? Well, in plain English, we have a notion of what a relation is. Uh, you, two people are related, like in a family point of view, two people are related, uh, maybe they're parent to child, or cousins, or, you know, third cousins once removed, whatever, spouses. These are all types of, like, family relationships. It means there's a connection between the two people in that situation. Uh, mathematically, we want to classify what is a relation, and it turns out we can do this with Cartesian products. Uh, so we say that a relation R between two sets, A and B, is actually a subset of their Cartesian product. Uh, written in another way, a relation is the subset of the Cartesian product A cross B. And so if we take some element of A, uh, the first set, and we take some element B from the second set, we say that A is related to B with respect to this relationship R, and we'll denote this as A, R, B. So the R is then used, the, the R of the set, which is the relation, is then used as a symbol connecting A to B. A is related to B with respect to this relation R. And we, we say A is related to B exactly when A comma B is an element of the subset. So if the ordered pair belongs to the subset, of the Cartesian product, then we say that A is related to B, and this will be denoted as ARB. Now, conversely, if A and B are not related, that would indicate that the element A comma B, 
the pair is not belonging to the set R, and this will typically be denoted as A not RB. So we draw a slash through it, typically in this direction here. We draw a slash through the symbol R to show that A and B are not related to each other. Now, while we can talk about relations in general between two sets, A and B, typically when we talk about relations, we actually only have one set in mind. So the set A and B are actually the one and the same thing. And so instead of saying that R is a relation from A to B, we actually might talk about a relation on A itself. Now, when we talk about functions in the future, those will be relations where the set A and B are not typically the same. Uh, but at least for the next couple lectures, we're going to be putting a lot of focus on when the relation is just on a single set. So we're looking for a subset of A cross A in that situation, which is often denoted as just A squared for short. Now, I, as the name suggests, relation, right? It's a mathematical relation captures the notion of a relationship between quantities. And it turns out we've seen relations all the time in mathematics. We just may not have thought about it in that way before. Like, for example, we could say that one is less than five. That is a mathematical relation. We might also say that three is not less than two. With every relation, you also get its negation, okay? One is less than five, but three is not less than two. Uh, when we work with equations, like, x plus 1 is equal to 3. It turns out that the equal symbol is itself a relation. It's connecting this quantity with that quantity. We say the two things are equal if it's the same quantity, but, you know, apparently they might look different based upon uh, the expression in play here. And like I said, with any, any relation, there is its negation. We could say that x plus 5 doesn't equal 3. Just put a slash to the relation and that's perfectly fine. Um, with regard to sets, the subset symbol, of course, is a relation. We say that this set is a subset of that set. And of course, we can also do its negation, right? Um, but we also get lots of variations here. We might say something like, well, A is a subset of B, but not equal to B. Again, lots of relations with regard to set containment. Um, we can also do this with element containment. Like, for example, one half is an element of the rational numbers. But let's say something like, oh, the square root of two is not a rational number. We've proven that. Um, and again, this this element, this in, like I'm an element in that set, that is itself a relational symbol. Um, and you're indicating a relationship. There's a relationship between this, this number and the set, and this would indicate, oh, you're an element of that set. There's a relationship between this number and that set, but it's the opposite. It's the negation. This relationship is that, oh, the square root of 2 is not an element of that set. And so we've seen lots of these things. Uh, let's take divisibility. 6 divides 24. Uh, but on the other hand, 5 does not divide 24. Again, these are examples of relations that we've introduced in our lecture series here. Uh, the divisibility symbol is a relationship between integers. And again, it doesn't stop there. We can keep on going, right? I mean, we, we had these uh, inequalities beforehand. 1 is less than 5. 3 is not less than 2. Um, we, of course, can do things like less than or equal to, greater than, greater or equal to, things like x squared is greater than or equal to y, or 3 is not greater than or equal to pi, things like that. The approximate symbol, right? Pi is approximately 3.14. There is a relationship there, but it's a different relationship to equality. Pi is not equal to 3.14, but there is a relationship of nearness. They're close to each other. Um, you know, we, we, we can do a lot of things. Like the square root of 2, we might say, is not approximately 10. Uh, you know, that maybe we think that's too far away. And so in mathematics, mathematics is rich with relationships. We're talking about them all the time. And so these are just some common relationships that we have seen pre in previous mathematics, also in this lecture series as well. So let's look at some examples of relationships in this more formal set theoretic setting that we defined on the previous slide. Let's take for our set the set of integers for a moment, and let's consider a relationship on the integers and integers. So just a relationship on the integers. We'll call it R. We typically refer to a relationship for R. It's a very clever mnemonic device there, R for relation. Uh, so we'll say that R is the set of ordered pairs inside of Z cross Z, satisfying the relationship that x minus y is a natural number. So x minus y is either equal to zero um, or it's a positive integer in that case. So let's look at some examples of this. So notice that by definition of this set, the element three comma two belongs to the set R. Uh, and that's because three minus two, which is equal to one, is a natural number. 
Now, since the order pair 3, 2 belongs to the set R, that means that 3 is related to 2 with respect to R. So we'd say 3R2. Okay, and, and we're using the symbol R here because we're talking about a generic relation, even though we have a specific one in mind here. But this is similar like saying like 3 is greater than 2 or 3 is equal to 2, which of course that's a false statement. Uh, but we just put the relational symbol between the two quantities that are related or not related. And so even if we don't have a specific symbol here, we can make up a new symbol on the fly, call it R. We use the same pattern there, a number related to a number. And then that, that relation, of course, could be the negation of the relation, of course. We'll see some examples of that. Uh, another example, we say that with respect to this relation R, 17 is related to 5. Why is that? Well, it's because 17 minus 5 is equal to 12. That is a natural number. And by definition, that means the ordered pair 17 comma 5 belongs to the relation. Uh, so if the order pair belongs to the set, that means the two elements in the relation is um, is uh, the related. Now be aware that as we've defined uh, relationships using ordered pairs, the order does in fact matter. If you switch the order, you can actually get a false statement. For example, when it comes to 5 minus 17, this is now equal to negative 12. And that is not a natural number since it's a negative number. And so this tells us that 5 is not related to 17 because R is related to 17 if and only if 5 comma 17 belongs to the set, but in this case, it does not. So if the order pair belongs to the set, then you're related. If the order pair doesn't belong to the set, then you're not related. And these are equivalent notions by the definition of a relationship. Uh, but as we've defined this one, be aware that if you switch the order of the two uh, elements, X and Y, you don't necessarily get um, you don't get the, the relatable. So in this case, you have that 17 is related to five, but five is not related to 17. If we go back to our examples of families, we could say something like, um, we could say something like you are the child of your parent, but like, let's just make, let's take some fictitious people here. We'll take Bob and we'll take uh, Susie here. And so we can say that Bob is the son of, of his mother, Susie here. And so that's the relationship, you know, Susie is Bob's parent, but you can't reverse that around. While Susie is Bob's parent, Bob is not Susie's parent. I mean, biologically that's impossible to do. Um, absence of weird sci-fi, tri tri you know, time traveling movies or something like that. Uh, so in that regard, it, it doesn't work. You can't reverse the relationship around. Um, Susie's the parent of Bob, but Bob is not the parent of Susie. And as such, some relationships cannot be turned around. As we've defined this relationship R in consideration here, you can't turn it around. So while 17 relates to 5, 5 does not relate to 17. Another example is 2 and 5 are not related because 2 minus 5 is negative 3, not natural number. The order pair 2, 5 does not belong to the relation. Therefore, 2 is not related to 5, even though 5 is related to 2. Okay, another example, negative two is not related to two because the order pair negative two comma two doesn't belong to R. If I take negative two and I subtract from it two, I get negative four, it's not a natural number. Okay, um, but I could say that I could say something like negative two comma negative two does belong to the relation. And that means that negative two is relatable to negative two. And in fact, I could say that for all integers n, you actually have that, that n is related to n. That actually is a thing you could prove. And this is something we'll look more into, of course, into the next lecture. So we won't focus on that right now. Now, I do want to make mention that this relationship R that we're talking about, this wasn't just drawn from the ether uh, whatsoever. This symbol, this R, this relationship R, is none other than just the greater than or equal to symbol uh, with respect to the integers, right? Um, integers have the property, this is a, this is true for all real numbers, in fact. The, uh, uh, two real numbers have the property that X is greater than or equal to Y um, if and only if x minus y is non-negative. That's what, that's what that means. Now, of course, this might seem like circular reasoning. So you could write that as like, oh, okay, um, x minus y is not negative. Like so. That's what, that's what greater than or equal to means here. Um, similar, less than or equal to is also defined similarly. So this relationship that we defined using r is actually a relation we already are familiar with. That does happen sometimes. Uh, let's look at another example. And this time I'm focusing on the real numbers. Uh, we're going to take S to be the 
to be the subset of R cross R, where we take all ordered pairs of the form X comma X. So this means that the ordered pair three, three is inside of S. So S, so E is related to E with respect to this relation S. Same thing, five is related to five with respect to this relation because five comma five would be inside the set. Conversely, two comma five doesn't belong to the relation, doesn't belong to the set. That's because two doesn't equal five. And therefore, S is not, excuse me, two is not related to five with respect to this relation. Um, now, this symbol right here is kind of given, given in a way, right? S is none other than the equal sign. And I know this kind of looks mathematically weird. S is equal to equals. <laughs> uh, but I'm describing the relationship, right? So this is a set. You can think of these things as sets, right? Um, we can actually view, this, again, as strange as you might think of this, we can view equals as a subset of R cross R because it's a relationship, uh, it's a relation on the set of R cross R. It's exactly this relation here. So as sets, S and equals are equal to each other. I know it seems kind of bizarre, but we're we're discussing relations in a in a formal, rigorous, abstract manner. And so this type of statement does come into play. So this statement here uh, is just saying that this relation we introduced is none other than the equal relation on the set R cross R. Or I should say on the set R. All right. So now. We've looked at some examples of relations. I want to look at a couple more before we end this video here. Uh, but one way of trying to understand a relation is to try to visualize this. This is not just true for relations, but in general, when you take an abstract concept like relations or sets, um, we often try to look for illustrations that can help us visualize the abstract concept. Like as we've talked about sets in the past, we use things like Venn diagrams to help us understand things like sets, unions, and intersections, etc. cetera, um, we can do a similar thing for relation. And so if you have a relation R, um, it's a relation from the set A, from A to B there, uh, because again, they're, they're ordered pairs, the direction does matter. So sometimes you emphasize from A to B. We can visualize a relation, particularly when it's a finite relation, um, using what's called a directed graph or a digraph for short. Now in advanced mathematics, there is a concept called a graph, and that typically is used to describe what we refer to as an undirected graph. And when I talk about graph, I don't mean like, here's the graph of y equals x squared. We have a very different meaning in mind here. Uh, in which case, what we're describing right now is formally a directed graph or a digraph. But if you do call it a graph, it's not exactly incorrect. Uh, but one must be careful in the combinatorial study of graph theory. Uh, there can be some, there's different meanings in play here. So I'm not, I don't want to get too much into that right now. Um, so we're going to introduce this notion of a digraph. Now, associated to every relation is a digraph. So this is the relation digraph. Uh, for which a digraph consists of two sets. There's one set which we refer to as the vertex set, and we have one set referred to as the edge set. Well, what is the vertex set? Well, for a the in general, this vertex set can be any set whatsoever, but when you're constructing the digraph associated to a relation, the vertex set will be the union of the two sets A and B. Which of course, if A and B are the same set, then you just get the vertex set is A. And the elements of the vertex set we refer to as vertices, vertices being the plural of vertex there. We think of them actually as points in the plane. So when we draw a graph, we often will draw it by drawing little circles, little points. So our vertex set could be something like this. And you could arrange it however you want for convenience. Next, what we're gonna do is then we consider this edge set. Sometimes it's called the arc set, um, but edge set's more commonly used here uh, in this context. Uh, you might call it a link also as a possibility. The edge set um, in, for a general digraph is gonna be a collection of arrows uh, that connect the vertices together. So you get something like this. So that arrow points to that one, this arrow points to that one, this one points to that one. And be aware that we draw arrows, but they don't have to be drawn straight for convenience. You could draw them however exotic as you want. That's perfectly fine. You have the possibility of an of a edge pointing back to itself. So you have a loop in that situation. Uh, sometimes when you draw digraphs, you allow the possibilities for uh, a multi, multi edge there, multiple edges. Um, you could also have them going in both directions. They are directed there, and but you can go in both directions. Now, if they go in both directions, sometimes you just drop the arrowheads entirely and just draw a single link right there. So this is for a pretty crazy graph that we've drawn on the screen right now. 
Uh, now, with regard to relations, the edge set of a relation is actually the, the relation itself. It's a set of ordered pairs, and they are ordered pairs um, called edges. Some, like I said, some people call them arcs, some people call them links. These are all synonyms in this place. Um, and they're, they're ordered pairs, but we can think of them as arrows with direction. So if this point was A and this vertex was B, then we would draw an arrow from A to B whenever A is related to B which of course happens if and only if uh, the ordered pair A comma B belongs to the relation. So that if, if A is related to B, if the ordered pair A comma B belongs to the relation, then we draw an arrow from the vertex A to the vertex B, respecting that direction. And like I said before, if it goes in both directions, you can drop the arrowhead because then there's no ambiguity in that situation. This can be a helpful visual tool to understand relations. So let's look at a few examples of finite sets um, and then draw their, their relational digraph there. So for the remaining examples of this video, consider the finite set A equals one, two, three, four, five. And so I'm gonna consider five different relations on top of this set A right here. The first one we're gonna call R, and the elements of the relation are the following, one, one, two, one, two, two, three, 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 two, three, one, four, 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 three, four, two, four, one, five, one, five, two, five, three, five, four, and five, five, okay? and the, this, of course, gives us a relation on a squared right here. And so how do we interpret this? Well, the, if you look at the first one, 1, 1, this means that the element 1 is related to 1. And it also means with regards to our diagram, we're going to draw an, we're going to draw an arrow from 1 back onto itself. This is what we called a loop from before. And if you look at the second element there, 2, 1, this means that 2 is related to 1. And we would draw in our digraph an arrow from 2 towards 1, showing that relationship that you can see right there. Um, 2, 2 indicates another loop, which we see right here. 3, 3 is also a loop, like so. Um, if you look at 3, 2, again, this means there's an arrow from 3 to 2. 3, 1 means there's an arrow from three to one, like so. And if we continue to do that for all of them, there's a loop for four, um, there's an arrow for three, there's an arrow for two, there's an arrow for one. Um, for five, there's a loop from five to five, there's an arrow from five to four, four, five to three, five to two, and five to one. Although I think I wrote those in different orders, so that doesn't really matter. So this right here is a very, very interesting looking relation. And so notice what we have here. If I look at the diagram, there is a relation from three to two there. Look at the direction there, of course. So three is related to two. But on the other hand, if we were to consider something like, okay, is one relatable to four? When you look at the arrow here, the arrow goes the wrong way. There's Four is related to one, but one is not related to four. So it turns out you don't have a relation between those things there. Now, if you view your set A as a subset of the integers, which makes sense, it's five integers, one, two, three, four, five, uh, this symbol again is none other than just our greater than or equal to symbol that we were looking at earlier. Uh, and so this relation, if you were to just restrict it to the five elements, one, two, three, four, five, uh, greater than or equal to would look something like this. And you'll notice that the arrow is always pointing from the bigger number to the smaller number. So like if you look at number one right here, all arrows point to one. Um, there's no arrows exiting one because with this set, one through five, one is the smallest number. It's not bigger than anyone. Um, so you'd stuck, you, if you get, if you were to follow like a path along this thing, you get stuck at one because one is the smallest there. Um, conversely, if you look at five, five is an example in this set where none of the arrows are pointing to five other than the loop itself, of course. Um, you, if you were to follow an arrow out of five, you can't get back to it because it's the biggest one. And so no one is related to five other than five itself because five is bigger than all the other ones. Let's look at another example. Uh, let's look at this example S right here for which our elements are the following. One goes to two, one is related to three, one is related to four, and one's related to five. Uh, we also have that two is related to three, two is related to four, and two is related to five. We have that three is related to four and three is related to five, and we have that four is related to five. So notice some of the things we have here. We have that three relates, I guess our relation is S now, three relates to five um, because of the arrow that we see right here. Um, but conversely, five does not relate to three because the arrow doesn't go the other direction. Now, again, this little diagram here, we still have our five points. Uh, there's no loops this time. Um, and the arrows are actually pointing the exact opposite direction. That's because in this situation, our symbol S is now the relation um, that we're going to do less than, the less than relation. One is less than two. Two is less than five. 
two is less than three, three is less than five. But notice it's not less than or equal to, right? Because if it were less than or equal to, our digraph would need to have all these loops put into that. Uh, you would need that the element is relatable to itself, which we don't see that in this diagram. Uh, we don't see it in the set, and so we don't get less than or equal to, but we do get less than. So it's kind of like the sort of like the opposite relation to what we had before. All right, let's look at this one here, T. This one's an interesting example here. The relation, as we have illustrated, is one is related to one, um, three is related to three, five is related to five, two is related to two, four is four, related to four. So in this case, everyone's related to themselves. You see these five loops in the diagram to suggest that these things are related to one another. Uh, that is, they're, they're related to each other. But what relationships do we have? One is related to three, um, three is related to one. So in this case, we do have arrows going in both directions. We haven't seen that in the previous examples. Like I said, sometimes you'll just draw this as an arrow, with, uh, it's a line with no arrows whatsoever is what I meant to say. But for our examples, we'll keep it as a digraph. So there's arrows going in both directions. We have that three is related to five, but we also have that five is related to three. So again, you see arrows going in both directions. Um, we also have that let, let's see what do we say one related to three three related to one we have that three is related to five five is related to three um and then we also have that one is related to five and five is related to one that was my missy one see arrows going back in directions there as well uh both directions now you see that in this case though if you look at one there is no relationship between one and two, but conversely, there's also no relationship between two and one. They're not connected to each other whatsoever inside of this graph. Two is related to itself and it's related to four. That's all there is. Um, on the other hand, you have four, which is related to two and four is related to four. And so while I drew this picture this way, using the same five pentagonal shape that I did before, the five, same five points, one could actually redraw this picture in the following way. You have sort of like a triangle where you have, again, double arrows. I'm just gonna write just lines in that situation. You have something like this, and there's the loops, of course. So it'd be like one, three, and five. And then you can actually move the picture entirely, like the two and four, like so. And so you can actually separate them, and you see that there really is like this separation in the graph. It's sort of like two subgraphs that have come together. This is an interesting example, because this example we're looking at right now is our first formal analysis of what we will eventually call an equivalence relation. An equivalence relation requires that the relation be reflexive, which basically means at this moment that there are loops at every single point on the graph. Um, it has to also be symmetric, which symmetric means that every arrow is actually double-headed. Um, it goes in both directions. And then thirdly, there's a property called transitivity for which if you're on one, you can actually loop around, right? You can go, if you're connected, you can, you can reach each other if you're on the same branch. Uh, but this one has these different components that aren't necessarily connected. It's not required for a equivalence relation. We'll define this formally uh, in a future lecture. But these properties about being reflexive, being symmetric, being transitive, these are topics that we will discuss in the very next uh, lecture, lecture 24 in our series here. Uh, let's look at just a few more examples and then we'll end this video on relations. Just meant to be an introduction. Now, one thing that'll be interesting to say here is that if you have two relations like S and T that we had before, uh, so the, the S relation we had before, remember that was the less than symbol. Our symbol T, uh, we didn't say anything about that yet, but that symbol T actually had to do with parity. Uh, notice that with the, uh, I think I misspelled the word parity there, JK on that one, parity. There you go. Um, when it comes to parity, we had in our in our relation that one through five were related because they're all odd numbers, and two and four were related to each other because they're both even numbers. So we have those two different relations that have meanings, less than and parity. We can actually combine them together. If you have two relations, you can take the intersection of the relation. What would that mean? Um, the intersection of the relation would suggest that you want the relation where this relation is satisfied and this relation is satisfied. After all, to be a relation, you just have to be a subset of A squared. And therefore, if you take the intersection of two subsets of A squared, you get another subset of A squared. It gives you a relation. So this would be the relation that incorporates the notion of and. The number is less than and they have the same parity. So this is going to give us a smaller relation. We have only a few, a few relations now. You have one three, because one is less than three, and they're both odd. You have one five, one is less than five, and they're both odd. You'll have three five, um, which again, three is less than five, and they're both, and they're both odd. And then lastly, you also have two four. Two of uh, two is less than four, 
and they're both even numbers. So notice our, our die graph is much more reduced this time. All of the loops we had before are gone because a number is not less than itself. And our two directions are now gone. It only points towards the bigger number now. So we actually can, we don't have the same structure that we had before with regard to our relations. Okay. Um, what I should also mention, one could do a similar thing with unions. Like you could take S union T. Um, what would that mean? This would be like, oh, you want to be less than or you want to have the same parity. Oh boy, why can't I spell this word today? Parity. In which case you could I'll let I'll let the viewer consider what would that what would that relation look like? What would the S union T look like? Because after all, as S and T are subsets, um, their union is also a subset of A squared. So it is also a relation. We could talk about the complements, right, of a relation. We could talk about um, set differences and all of those, all of those mechanics we can do with sets, you can do with relations as well, because they themselves are subsets. All right. So let's look at one last example here. Let's, we're now on, uh, we're now on you, uh, going through the alphabet here, you, um, this time you has the relation that it's one is related to three, three is related to three, five is related to two, two is related to five and one is related to two for which if you illustrate that in a diagraph, you get the following thing. There are some oddities to mention about this one. So first, why does three have a loop and no one else has a loop? We haven't seen that before. Um, when loops were present, they seem to actually be universally present in our diagrams. This one only has a loop at three, nowhere else, okay? Um, some things we have seen before is like everyone exits from one, everyone enters into five. Okay, we haven't seen that before. So you could call this like a source and this like a sink because once the water goes down the sink, you can't take it out anymore. Uh, but look at four, like no one is related to four. Not even four itself is related to four. Now four is part of the set A, but there's no relations between four. It seems kind of odd, but that is that is a perfectly acceptable relation. Now, when you look at this one, this relation U, it kind of feels like, well, I can't really think of any familiar relation that connect here, like less thans, equal tos, um, uh, parity, all those ones we could describe with you using words, but this one doesn't really have a, a familiar description. You could argue this is like a random relation, but be aware to be a relation, you just have to be a subset of the ordered pair. So this is a relation just as good as all the other ones. We might not have the appropriate context to the relation, but it is still a relation nonetheless. And so as a closing remark, I want to make mention here that if you take the power set of A cross B, this is the set of all relations from the set A to the set B. Every subset of A cross B is a relation. So if you take the power set, all of the subsets, you get all the relations. Um, and there are two notable relations I should make mention. There is the relation A cross B itself. What if everyone is related to everything? That's, that is a relation. Is it a very interesting relation? Maybe, depends, uh, but that is a relation. And on the other extreme, the empty set. The empty set is a subset of A cross B. It gives you the empty relation, the relation where no one is related to each other. So like in this case, four is not related to anyone. The empty relation would be that no one is related to anyone. It's an extreme, but it is a relation, right? Oftentimes we're going to look for some happy medium, right? We're looking for a subset between A cross B and empty set. There are some relations, but we don't necessarily want all the relations because if everyone's related, then then maybe there's no, that doesn't mean anything, right? If the relationship is everything, then there, there, maybe there's no relationship at all, right? The distinction is kind of is the relevant thing in that situation. All right. And so this gives us some examples of relations. Um, I hope you enjoyed these examples. Uh, in the next lecture, as already mentioned, we'll actually start studying properties of relations, um, things like transitive, reflective, uh, symmetric, anti-symmetric, just to name uh, some of the possibilities.